We're going to dive in now to our, the rest of our program, so please join me in welcoming on stage Congresswoman Doris Matsui, a, a senior member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Congresswoman Matsui is also the co-chair of the Task Force on Aging and Families. From Medicare to Retirement Security, she has made it her priority to address issues that matter most to seniors. Joining her on stage is my colleague, The Hill's editor-at-large, Steve Cummings. Thank you, Brittany. Good morning, everybody. Um, how many of you have a burning question today? So I want to see the hands now, so I can go to them. I know what Carl Schmidt has one, right? There, there's Carl. Who, so we're going to get to some questions. I want to make sure that we uh, involve you. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. Let my me pleasure. just start this out, because whenever we do these forums, you know, I wonder, is anybody else out there interested? You know, we have, The Hill has a shocking uh, shockingly large number of people who, who watch many of our programs online. So hello, uh, online viewers, it's great. But when you're out in Sacramento and you're talking uh, to your constituents, mm -hmm. is Medicare a hot issue? Uh, yes, Medicare is a hot issue. In fact, everybody loves Medicare. I mean, I am co-chair of the Task Force on Aging and Families, and we added families to this because it's really a family issue, whether you're a millennial or a boomer, or really at the end of your cycle. I just have to say that we hear about it a lot. And in our congressional office, we get the calls on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. Uh, and that's really when the rubber hits the road. Uh, people are having concerns and problems. They come to the congressional office. Now, part of the reason we're here today is to talk about Medicare, particularly Part D reform, mm -hmm. but looking at the broad package and, and, and you know, lifting up a little bit, uh, it really looks like a social contract question to me. What's our social contract with seniors today? How is it evolving what it should be? And I'm interested in how you would grade the Trump White House's uh, performance on the social contract for seniors. Well, let me tell you, I still believe that it is a social contract. I think it's something that was uh, definitely something uh, that was instigated in, in the sense that we have this obligation. And that still is something that is there. We pay into it, the social insurance. And in a sense, that has continued all the way, the sense that it is ours. And uh, I believe that that contract continues. Where the Trump administration is going is perhaps to be a disruptor again. And you know, you have something that's been going on for years and years, and people are used to it. They love it. They like the fixes to it. They want to make sure it's protected. But you cannot come through and change it and disrupt it. And I believe that's what the Trump administration wants to do, as they are trying to do with the Affordable Care Act. It doesn't work. Um, people now understand that health care is something that is a right for them. It's a given, and they don't like it if you mess with it. So as I understand it, one of the big challenges right now is to look at the rising out-of-pocket mm -hmm. costs for seniors. Uh, and we can call it the donut hole. We can talk it about the, uh, the areas, you know, the 5% of, of a, a very expensive drug is a, is a, is a lot, lot, even if it's 5%. Uh, at the same time, and I've, I've talked with Secretary Azar about this, I know the government is trying to sort of look at ways it can use market powers and market forces to try to control uh, mm -hmm. some of the costs in the, in the Part D um, uh, tent, if you will. And, and at the same time, the government wants to reduce the share of what it pays. It sounds like a classic <laughs> whack-a-mole problem, right? You know, you trying said to. It. So, so what is the Doris Matsui fix? Well, my fix is you have to look at the whole thing, and honestly, we have, this is a shared responsibility, and the federal government can't just offload it onto the beneficiaries or to the plans or manufacturers. We are all in this together, and the market can only go a certain distance. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, with uh, high-cost drugs for particularly uh, those terribly ill. I mean, many of them are single source. What are you gonna do with them anyway, right? In many cases, you know, the beneficiary pays a certain amount, and then the plans are responsible. So we really feel that something there is wrong, in a sense, there's no competition there. So it only goes a certain amount of time, uh, length of time. So I really feel that we really have to all, I think as a previous speaker said, we all have to be at the table there. And we need to balance this out because as you go through the tiers of, uh, you know, once you hit the donut hole and you get the catastrophic care, if you look at it, you know, we get 5% as beneficiary, which can be an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But after that, the federal government takes up everything else. And that's really not where we should be. We should probably 
uh, look at this and look at where the plans are and maybe have the manufacturer take more responsibility as they have done in the donut hole. So these are things that we're looking at. And as far as, um, you know, out-of-pocket costs, that is a huge deal for seniors. Do you right? support capping those costs? We are having discussions right now with uh, Ways and Means because obviously, you know, we share Medicare with them. So we are sharing that because we believe, uh, I support caps. Now we have to look at the whole thing though mm -hmm. also because if you have the caps, then what do you do with the premium? So we right. have to look at where the beneficiary is going to be. And I, I really am truly one that looks at where the patient is. I mean, what, what are their out-of-pocket costs? What does it do to the family? And uh, look to see where we can balance this out. You know, this may be too cosmic, but as I <laughs> have kind of tried to read everything I could in this arena, and this is sort of healthcare, future of healthcare week for the Hill. Not only do we have this wonderful forum today on, on the Medicare equation, we have a major forum on the future of healthcare tomorrow with lots of stakeholders. And mm -hmm. so we're really bringing uh, uh, everyone to the table. And one of the things is you, that you see when you go around the country, whether it's Sac Sacramento or where my family's from in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, there are different levels of literacy out there, right. both on the side of the patient in terms of understanding what's coming on, uh, at them, uh, in the provider side of mm -hmm. things, and the complexity and change and evolution uh, really in the provision of healthcare seems to be something that has become extraordinarily complex. Maybe that's a good thing. But I'm just wondering whether there are things we ought to be doing. You know, I know that you've been supportive and that Alex Azar and others are trying to create greater transparency in pricing uh, and to create an opportunity for doctors who are prescribing drugs mm -hmm. to be able to give the you know, straight talk on costs to patients and maybe that will drive up literacy. But I just, did you ever get constituents saying, I don't get this, this oh, is overwhelming? All the time, even among members of Congress because it's very complicated. Mm. And one of the things we had uh, as far as a, uh, stakeholder discussion, question, why don't we understand? I mean, this is really kind of ridiculous. There must be some process in which we can be educated. And I think those are the, one of the things that we really want to attack because, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that there's a certain point in time at a certain age that you have to get on Part B if you're going to do that. Otherwise, right. you're penalized. A lot of people don't know that at all. So at the very beginning, we should at least have that. you got on Part that. B to get on Part right. D. Right, so there we are, right? right? And so, and for the rest of their life, they have a penalty, right? If they didn't get on at the right time. That's something that should be just natural, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really do need to have some sort of conversation. We always talk about coordinated care. We need to have also coordinated action, coordinated information out there for people to understand. My hope is because of the focus on health care, whether it was Affordable Care Act or now Medicare in particular in Part D because of the high cost of the drugs, people are beginning to look at what we can do in order to incentivize more savings. What do we do in order to get the right prescription to the patient, the one that's really going to help them? And there is much more um, awareness that docs and hospitals and the pharmaceuticals and everybody and the plans have to be involved in this. Do you think there's a way to get that ecosystem right without at the same time undermining the right incentives for continued investment in technology and research and new product development? Uh, this weekend I was out in the eastern shore of Maryland, Chestertown, Maryland, if anybody knows that. Mm -hmm. So I went out and I just began interviewing people at the local coffee shop, played against Sam's, you know, who I <laughs> knew were in, in the sort of uh, senior ranks. Everybody loved and was intimately aware of the drugs right. they trusted and liked. Everybody largely generally liked their doctors. They liked Medicare. They may not understand whether they were Part B, Part D, what supplemental they had. That was interesting that they were less aware of the program, but just that they were covered. Right. But no one liked the government. Ah. So <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting... Uh, you know, I was kind of, you know, testing, you know, are, are, are the pharma companies, they, they <laughs> love the pharma companies, they love the options of what was doing, and they were aware of what they needed, but for all of them, cost was a challenge. And so you saw these two equities, if you will, both wanting to have things that helped uh, enhance their lives, make their lives mm -hmm. better, deal with their health issues as they, as they age, but at the same time, 
uh, the cost factors were huge. And I'm just interested in how you see that we don't forfeit one side, that we don't become a zero-sum oh, game yeah. between, between cost and innovation. No, listen, I'm from California. We really believe in innovation. Mm -hmm. I believe innovation for innovation's sake is not the goal. In essence, we really have to know what we're going to be doing. We have a lot of drugs out there now. And some of them are so expensive that when you think about it, is it something that we ought to invest in when it would take away so much investment from the other part of Medicare? Mm -hmm. Now, it's kind of curious to say they don't like the government involved in Medicare when it really is a government program. We pay into it and all of that. But <coughs> if you look at catastrophic care, you look at, I think it's 70% where the government pays. I mean, that's a lot of money. So, yes, the drug companies, the manufacturers, the innovations are really important. But we need a method to get them there, and that's really Medicare. And the sharing is really, is really what's important there. And uh, I really believe that Medicare is probably one of the best programs we have. Everybody knows about it. You're right. We really don't know how it operates. People don't know how it operates, but they want it. And they want to make sure that they get the drugs at the time that they want it, and they don't want to pay a lot. We're trying to balance that out so that the costs aren't as expensive as they were before, and also that the cost of drugs are part of it, too, and balance this out. You look at the cost of the health care. The first part we're looking at is prescription drugs. There are other mm -hmm. aspects, too, that we have to look at. But that is something that we're hearing all over the country from our constituents and my colleagues' constituents the cost of drugs. So we have to bring down the cost of prescription drugs, but that also means there has to be a balance here, too. You, you and Speaker Pelosi um, have talked about these issues quite a bit, and, and one of the, the lines you had is that uh, Democrats are fighting for the people, you said, and are offering a better deal to lower the cost of prescription drugs with tough new enforcement of drug price gouging, allowing Medicare Part D to negotiate lower drug prices, and demanding transparency of big pharma's price hikes. Do you still share that view, do you, or do you think that's being remedied now by some of the things that Alex Azar is doing by way of transparency and suggesting in the mm -hmm. Part D uh, uh, tent, if you will, that, that moving towards negotiations mm -hmm. and, and competition there is happening? It seems that that's the one part that didn't really get clarified too much, and there seems to be a sigh of relief in a lot of quarters that they didn't get clarity, but I'm just wondering where you're at now. Do you s continue to see, because there's a, that's where the costs are, right? Right, that's where the costs are, and I really believe that, I think transparency is important. I think there's a good movement there, and I think that's what um, HHS administration is doing, but we also have to have accountability there, too. And we really have to um, work with the manufacturers, work with the plans, understand that just to have transparency isn't enough. And transparency, to me, is good in almost everything. But then what next? And that's where the action steps come in. And I think that's where we are headed toward now. And so until we get there, we're going to keep pushing. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that we want to make sure that our seniors and families are covered in the way they want to be covered. And we want to make sure the costs are brought down, not to their detriment, mm -hmm. but in order to ensure that they can afford, you know, health care that they need and deserve, but also that we are balancing out the system so the plans are maybe, their incentives are realigned, the manufacturers are brought to the table, not to gouge them or anything like that, because we still want to have the innovation, but there's a way to move forward on this. Um, you look what happened with uh, closing the loophole, with, um, in a sense, of bringing the manufacturer to the table, where they really have a responsibility there, too, to really come in and reduce their costs. So there are ways to get there. Um, I think to a certain degree, we tend to be out there and very forward moving on that because we know that's what it takes. Um, it's a complicated, healthcare is complicated. We all know that we need it. And we've all had situations where our family members have been involved in it in some way. Everybody at some point in time is gonna need it. And uh, that's why it's so important, and it's kind of Absolutely. a universal right here. So let me um, ask you, one of the thoughts I've often had is, too, you know, sometimes as a journalist, I wonder whether, whether our own biases and assumptions that we bring uh, uh, are just too loaded. And, and in this debate, I've wondered a little bit in whether there's been too much finger pointing at the pharmaceutical industry um, in the sense that if you 
look at the social contract that's supposed to exist there. You have you know, a science base, you have investment, you have companies that take risks, they come out with mm -hmm. drugs, they get property rights for a certain period of time. And then after that period of time, you, the, the information, the testing, the results with um, human patients can often, you know, is transferred to generic manufacturers, to the generics come on. You see the same thing going on with biologics and biosimilars. Mm -hmm. Again, if everything is going right and everyone's behaving, right. there seems to be an innovation base with high reward but, but high impact that then gets socialized over a certain time with right. new entrance market. So, so I, I some, and then if you look at the pricing side of it, one of the things I've, I've spent a lot of time is, the other parts of the pricing picture aren't always the frontline drug. It can be the pharmacy benefit managers, sure. it can be you know, the questions about how insurers are handling. So there is a big ecosystem yeah. on pricing that we're not talking about. So, so I agree with you, talk, but it's so big, it's like it's a big. universe. And, and so I guess I want to give you a chance, who's the real enemy in oh. your view? <laughs> well, it's probably somebody who wants extreme profit, is what it is. And I'm going to tell Screlly? No. Yeah. Listen, yeah. looking at this here, um, we're trying to attack the pricing for drugs. And yes, it's supposed to work the way you're talking about, but sometimes it doesn't, and that's why we're going in right now. For instance, like um, we have a Creates Act that we passed mm -hmm. on the House, which in essence what it does is ensure that some of the generics can actually from, get from the FDA samples right. so that they can actually create the drugs, right? And we have things like pay for delay for when some of the brand drugs and some of the generics kind of get together and say, okay, don't put your drug on the market yet for a while, okay? Now those are the kinds of things we would like to fix right now which would make the system work better, in essence. And mm -hmm. listen, I don't believe that the drug companies are necessarily the bad guys. I think that everybody wants to look at this, and if they have an angle, they're going to pursue it. I think it's up to us as policymakers to look at the whole system and say, OK, sometimes you need some adjustments. And we looked at Part D, and we fixed it. And look, look at the catastrophic side now. If you look at the fact that we want to lower the cost of Medicare, if you look at the fact that the beneficiary pays a certain amount, was it 5%, and then you look at the whole thing with plans, you look at what the, um, the federal government pays, it pays the biggest amount. So why can't we look at that and say, how can we make that more fair so that the federal government doesn't pay as much or pay what it should pay? If, you know, the plans and the companies don't have any incentives if the federal government just pays. So I think we have to look at every step along the way. And I really believe that we're making progress. It's slow. Mm. But everybody seems to go and be in the same lane now that something has to be done. Speaking of the federal government paying a lot, are you for or against Medicare for all? Oh, let me tell you this. I'm for universal coverage. Mm. I would tell you this. I was on the Energy and Commerce Committee when we wrote and we passed the Affordable Care Act. There was a lot of late nights and lots of negotiation on that. Medicare for all is not there at this point. Mm -hmm. There's been nothing there yet. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a long time if it ever becomes law to become law. And if you look at the fact that... So you're a realist on this. I am a real, and also, but I'm a, I'm a person who understands that we're not ever going to stand still. And there are coverage gaps. And I really believe we could look at people saying public option. We try to get that before in the Affordable Care Act. We couldn't fit in there. But you know, buying into Medicare or Medicaid, I think, are steps along the way. And I think it doesn't disrupt the system. As I said before, most people like their Medicare. They love it. And I really feel it's important to respect that and understand it's a system in place that's working. Let's try to improve it. Congressman Bob, or Brett Guthrie, is about to come up, mm -hmm. a colorful congressman from Kentucky who you know well <laughs> on energy and commerce. Yes. Where do you mostly agree with him, and where do you mostly disagree with him? Well, I'll tell you, um, Brett Guthrie and I are partners in many things, and particularly in spectrum issues. Mm. Uh, we very work closely together with that. And as far as healthcare, we do agree on some things, but you know, as it always is, and there, I work with other um, on the other side, like Bill Johnson on telehealth, and even Billy Long on various things too. So. We are very respectful of each other. He said he's going to listen to this and rebut me on everything. And I said, fine, that's OK. <laughs> we do that all the time. But we do with respect. And uh, I think that's really very important, because all of us are in this in order to ensure 
that we do the best possible job for our constituents. Before I go to the audience, I want to ask you know one slightly uh, out of left field question. You know, oh. the, the administration is taking on a lot of things at the same time, uh, and one of them is on the trade front. And, and and what I do know in the pharmaceutical area is that we have a globally integrated uh, uh, supply chain in the drug and pharmaceutical industry. We have uh, research both here in the United mm -hmm. States, but research plants elsewhere. You look at any major pharmaceutical term. I don't know the case with Astellas, but I imagine there are global dimensions to Astellas as well. What is the, What are the trade saber rattling doing to the pharmaceutical sector? Well, I can tell you what it does for the other sector too, so it's got to mm -hmm. be really uh, disheartening and it's really concerning to all of us. I really feel that we are in a global economy and uh, it's much more challenging today than it's ever been in the past when some of these deals were made before. And so I think in particular, if we think about innovation, we think about privacy, we think about the whole range of things, um, I think every sector is very, very concerned. And I really feel the pharmaceuticals have every right to be concerned. Uh, we're very, very concerned on this as we move forward because if you think at every step of the way what could happen uh, with the other countries not having the kind of rules that we have and the respect that we have for each other, it's gonna be very difficult. That's why I think that trade in particular uh, now has become I mean, it's always been somewhat contentious, but very contentious today. And uh, I feel that uh, not only for um, economic reasons, but for security reasons, too, it's really important for the whole public to get engaged in it. And, and just, just finally, I cheated the audience a little bit. The, on, <laughs> on, on protected classes in, oh. in Medicare Part D, do you support the list we have now of antidepressants, antipsychotics, anticonvulsants, immunosupports, antiretrovirals, uh, anti-cancer drugs? Do you, do you like that list? Would you expand that list? Or do you want to knock something off? Well, listen, I want to keep the protected classes. I think it's- All really of them as they are. Very, yeah, very important. And I, the, the administration has stopped what they were going to be doing. Because if you look at particularly, you look at uh, people with uh, mental illness and have particular drugs, it's very, very difficult to find the right medication that is going to assist you and you finally find one. And then you want to, and you have to step back and start over again for cost purposes. That doesn't work at and all. And do you think so. the administration has definitively given up on... I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And they've stopped so far, and we'll keep at it, because I think anyone who has... If they finally found the medication that works, you don't want to go backwards on that. And we, I've seen too many cases where people have changed medications, and all of a sudden, they've had much difficulty. All right, let me go to the audience here. Let me uh, ask for questions, comments. Oh, there's Carl Schmidt. Carl? Carl is my we friend with everything. the AIDS Institute. I'm a big fan of your work. Go ahead. Yeah. There's a mic coming to you, Carl. Carl, I told you in advance. Okay. Uh, thanks for bringing up the Medicare um, patient um, out-of-pocket cap. What do you think the chances are of Congress uh, and the administration embracing and actually doing it uh, this year? There's a lot of support both sides of the aisle and the administration included in their budget. Well, I, yeah, since the administration understands how important it is and certainly energy and commerce and ways and means are working on this. And so we really feel we have to attack, I mean, I hear from my constituents all the time, I think everybody hears about what is it gonna cost me, right? Well, what's the healthy cap in your point of view? Well, I don't really know what the healthy cap, I'm not gonna say right now what the healthy cap is right now, because right. right now it's really, I mean, there's no cap, right? Right, right. So anything is better, I suppose. But <sighs> you look at, uh, you know, uh, employer plans and you look at the ACA, they have caps, so we should have caps. We'll figure out what that is. Interesting. Other questions? Yes, right here, sir. Let me get, uh, bring the mic to you for our online viewers. Say hi to the online viewers. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is more a Medicare in general or healthcare in general comment. Um, my wife and I are not old enough to, for, to qualify for Medicare, and we don't have company-paid health insurance, mm -hmm. so we're paying through our teeth for right. the ACE for health coverage. Um, and I had an uncle um, who told me one time, he's a diehard Republican, and he said, um, <laughs> we need to cut big government, but don't mess with my Medicare yeah. or Social Security. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> um, so, um, did you have a longer conversation with him? <laughs> no, there's no point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I did trade, uh, trade eyeballs with my son who was also in the car and he just, we just looked at each other and shook our head. Um, <laughs> but so 
we've had a lot of discussions about uh, how to improve health care mm -hmm. cost for those people like us who are under 65. Sure. And one of the things is we'd like to be able to buy into mm -hmm. Medicare. Right. And I don't know if that's being discussed. Well, and then yeah. our other, and our other um, solution is to increase competition, which the Republicans should be all in favor for, is if any company is offering health care to companies in a given state, they also have to offer an ACA plan. Mm. Great. So why don't we, we take those there and get your comments? Well, first of all, I do support buying into Medicare. I think as we've heard from enough people to understand, there's that situation place when they just can't seem to make it just a little bit more time. And I think that's part of the aspects of uh, what we want to do in order to improve uh, health care. And I think that's really very important. As far as competition, I think competition is really important. I think it, the thing is, is that we also have to make sure that um, we still have the essential benefits that are so important because so much of that is being undermined today. Uh, when you think about the fact that we have these uh, plans that, you know, that really don't work at all, cheap plans that don't cover anything and people feel like they've covered but then when they really kind of have an illness or something, there's nothing there. So I think we really make, sh we have to make sure that if we do allow these things to happen, which I think are really good, that we have certain aspects of it that are, uh, as we did with the Affordable Care Act, being able to cover certain essential things. Congresswoman, as we, as we just close out here, if, you know, discussing the Medicare, Medicare equation, if you were going to have an obsession with Medicare <laughs> this next week, which I know you do already, but what would be the one or two just oh. quick things that you think deserve immediate priority that you want to share with an audience that, that is interested in this subject? What should they know about? What are you obsessed with in the, in, well, in the equation? Well, I'm life? obsessed with a lot of things here because mm -hmm. Medicare is very complicated. But I think if you look at the fact that we look at generics, we think it's really very important. And seniors understand that all generics are just as good as the brand drugs, but they want more access to it. So anything we can do to get more access, which we have been working on in order to ensure that um, the seniors really have the opportunity to get the drugs they want. I mean, look. One of the things that we talked about some time ago was that pharmacists couldn't tell uh, the patients that come in that actually this drug would be cheaper if you pay cash for it, right? They were not allowed to do that. But now we pass a bill, and I think that the administration is on board with that and a rule now to do that. So the pharmacist, who can be your best friend on this, can say, actually, you don't have to submit this in your plan. You can pay cash. Hmm. It's cheaper. I mean, so I take it at the very um, patient level because that's where we hear it, we hear from my constituents, and then we go up and try to figure out where the policy is to fix it. And I think that if we look at how we, in the policy, we need to make sure that we get more generics out to um, our patients is really much more important so that we kind of clear it so that people can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Congresswoman Doris Matsui, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you.